The Downtown Rams podcast is brought to you today by Draft. Looking for the best fantasy sports site on the planet? Sign up with Draft today. For a limited time only, our listeners will receive $3 matching their first deposit of at least $10. Use promo code DTR or visit draft.com slash DTR to sign up now. Draft, fantasy for the people. Now enjoy the show. Caught by Brandon Cooks. Shoot your arrows. Cooper Cup walks it out of the air and gives the Rams the lead. Robert Wood, touchdown. L.A. Goff goes crashing into the end zone. Aaron Donald almost beat the football there. Corey Littleton, have yourself a day. Picked off. Marcus Peters. Coming off the edge. And Ryan will be wrapped up by Clay Matthews. Everett in stride. Wow. Franklin Myers gets his hand down there. Little got a hand on it. Did he pick it? He did! Racing down the sideline is a key to lead. Gurley for MVP! Touchdown LA! Picked off by John Johnson. Well, Dante Fowler, who is able to get to breathe. Greg Zerline sends the Ram to the Super Bowl! Whoa! LA wow. will play for the Lombardi! Welcome back, guys, to episode 258 of the Downtown Rams podcast. I'm your host, Jake Ellenbogen. Joining me, as always, is Alexis Kraft uh, coming off her illness. She's back, and uh, we're back to talk about the Rams and all the uh, the issues going on in Los Angeles right now. So, Alexis, uh, how are you feeling? Are you feeling any better? Because, like... I know people were questioning, like, oh, if she just has the flu, like, you know, the Jordan flu game thing. And I've gone on record saying, like, look, like, this girl literally goes above and beyond just to make it happen. So are you you good or are you still fighting through stuff? Um, I'm much better. Um, it, It was real touch and go there for a little bit, Jake. Um. You know, wasn't really, really sure what was going to happen. But uh, no, I, I did receive a lot of um, kind words and messages on, on social media. So thank you all for that. Um, I did have the flu. Um, it was awful. I It hit me out of nowhere. And as Jake knows, I was literally fine all day last Saturday. Um, so about 10, 10 days ago. And I literally was deep cleaning that day. Um, I was deep cleaning everything. And out of nowhere, it felt like I got hit by a truck. I wasn't sure what was going on. I just felt awful. I got a fever. I just felt really bad. And I went to urgent care because I just, you know, I thought, you know, something obviously was going on. They gave me a flu test. The flu test was positive. Um, So they gave me Tamiflu. They hooked me up to an IV. I was there all night, got home, and it was just really rough. Um, I ended up losing my voice, actually, um, for like two days. Um, and I couldn't even talk. So I, so when you guys did the, um, uh, we did the Steelers like game preview. Um, I was out, um, for the game. Uh, I had no voice. I, I couldn't, I couldn't talk. So I'm glad to be back. Glad to be able to get to talk, talk about, um, the Ram Steelers game. Um, and you know, Jake, I'll let you, uh, start off with that. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're back. Um, obviously, I didn't even want to do the show without you, but you know what? Uh, I decided to, and, and you gave me your blessing because we don't really do much without the other. Obviously, we're not going to do the other podcasts without the other because that's the whole point of the other podcast. But this one, didn't want to go off script. We did, and now you're back. So we'll talk about this game. Um, quite honestly, I was uh, very disappointed, you know, just looking at the way the Rams played on on defense, um, you know, just the way the the production they got out of the pass rush, um, you know, the production they got out of their uh, their cornerbacks, and you know, they had great linebacker play, uh, guys that stand out, of course, uh, Corey Littleton, you know, Aaron Donald, uh, Clay Matthews, Fowler. I mean, it, they got a lot of production out of those guys. Ramsey really shut down Juju Smith Schuster. But it all went to the Rams defense, a uh, Rams offense, and, um, and there are so many issues. There are a myriad of issues there. Uh, you know, I think the biggest issue is when you have Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, and Gerald Everett, and Todd Gurley, and you can only score, you know, three points. Um, you know, on the road, um, it's just not not good. 
not not acceptable. Um, so I mean, I, I understand the Steelers have a great defense; they play extremely well. Hats off to them. Um, you know, you just you look at what Mason Rudolph was able to do managing that football game uh, without James Conner, might I add, um, and pretty much without Juju because I mean he's completely taken out of the game by Ramsey. Um, you know, I was definitely impressed with the way the Steelers played. However. Uh, the the officiating was a debacle, um, but it wasn't even as bad as the offense. Uh, it was quite honestly pathetic. Uh, Todd Gurley ran 12 times for 73 yards. Um, the, he was not seen in the fourth quarter in a uh, one-score affair. Um, Jared Goff had no time to throw, but when he did, uh, it was just not a pretty sight. So, yeah, the offense looks broken. Um, I'm hoping they get it fixed. I really have a bunch of questions I went back and, you know, as you know, and a lot of people that are listening to this know, I went back and I've said it over and over and over again on this show, on on social media, on my live streams. Jerry Goff has not been the same since his week 11 hit against Kansas City last year. Um, I, I know there are a lot of variables that go into that. You could look at uh, Cooper Cup's absence, although, you know, his him and the Rams put up 51 points against Kansas City. Chiefs, you know, to win that football game. So I, I don't really buy into, you know, that um, because th- that was all without Cooper Cup. Um, you could make the argument, I guess, for Todd Gurley's disappearance, but the next game against the Detroit Lions coming off the bye, uh, Goff was atrocious, didn't look comfortable at all. His mechanics were off, um, and Todd Gurley went off in that game and really carried them to victory. So it wasn't that. Um, you could make the argument play calling. You could make the argument uh, offensive line uh, somewhat deteriorating towards the end of the season. I mean, you know, Austin Blythe, he really took a step back at the end of the year. Uh, you saw Havenstein and Whitworth get dominated by the Patriots in the Super Bowl, but I'm sorry I don't buy any of that. Um, you know, I, I think really it it could uh, very well be because of that hit. And, you know, people will say over and over again that I'm trying to, you know, overanalyze the situation or I'm saying that the Rams didn't diagnose a concussion. I'm not even talking about a concussion here. I'm talking about, you know, like Mark Sanchez with the butt fumble, how it like ruined his career. Um, I'm hoping this didn't ruin Jerry Goff's career, but it was the hardest hit I've ever seen him take. Uh, He was on the ground for quite a long time. And I mean, I already put the stats up there. I mean, he, he fumbles just about every game now. That was never the case. Uh, his passer rating was over 103 before the hit under Sean McVay after it's in the 70s. It's just it's it, it looks pretty clear to me. Um, again, I can understand your arguments, but, you know, to me, I, I don't see the confidence. And I think, you know, really where I'm getting at here is when you watch him in, against Pittsburgh coming off a bye. Um, I expected more, you know, I expected, okay, you know, we've been talking about the rust. Well, it's week 10, the rust should be gone. And you saw, I mean, even when he had time and I get totally understand he is in the shotgun and he's getting hit. I get that. And I, I understand how you could, you know, make the argument while he's constantly getting pressure. It's hard for him to really compose himself, but isn't that what a quarterback's supposed to do? I mean, the way I look at it is, if you are paid that much money to do your job, you are considered clearly one of the best in your field. So Jared Goff, the Rams were basically saying, is one of the best quarterbacks in football. And he was the franchise guy, and that's why they went with him. And this isn't like me hating on Goff, but it's just you know my observations from this game, just sitting there in the pocket. And like when he had time, he's staring down his receivers. Um, you know, he's making poor decisions, trying to – you know, throw, um, you know, over the top to, you know, Tyler Higby down the sideline when there's literally safety help there, he gets picked off, um, you know, just not really stepping up in the pocket, really being a statue, not moving out. I mean, granted, there were injuries in this game. I do have to point out Brian Allen got hurt. Um, you know, of course, they've lost snow boom for the year. That's been, you know, pretty well stated, but Brian Allen's now out for the year, their center. So they had to kind of reshuffle the whole offensive line. Then Havenstein gets hurt. So I'm not really necessarily talking about the end of the game. Uh, because, I mean, you have Colbin Shelton in there who has never started an NFL game before. But the the thing I saw is just it, it was during the game when it was – when it was close, I didn't see Goff take the next step and really lead his team to victory. This game should have been won by the Rams. Now, the referees had a lot to do with it as well, but you have to give the Steelers credit because they made more plays than the Rams and put themselves in a position to ultimately win the football game. But 
I also have to say before I give you the microphone, um, Sean McVay has really struggled calling plays. So here's the thing. If Jared Goff is struggling and he really can't find his rhythm, you got to stop putting him in these seven step dropbacks with no offensive line to speak of. Okay, you are not going to lose every single matchup because it's an NFL offensive line versus an NFL defensive line. Now, granted, the defensive line is probably a lot better than the the offensive line, but in the grand scheme of things, these are professionals. They'll still win a snap here and there. And that is when Goff is, you know, it, you know, he has time and he needs to make a play. But when, you know, you are constantly having pressure, why are you running five and seven step dropbacks? Wouldn't you just try and you know, go with the approach of death by a thousand paper cuts and try and, you know, continue to do what the Patriots always do with Tom Brady, quick slants right up the middle, um, you know, on the field. I mean, I just don't feel like the Rams, one, they know their identity. Two, they really care to know their identity. Three, know what they're doing on offense. And, you know, four, I think they've really neglected some of the, the key nuances of their previous offense that has led to such struggles. And, Another thing I'll add, Todd Gurley. Okay, Todd Gurley, you know, everyone's talking about the knee and how he can't carry, you know, for 20 times a game. Um, And by the way, the Rams are undefeated when he does. But I'll say this. Todd Gurley, if he can only carry 13 times a game, it's pretty simple what you should do. If you only have 13 carries for Todd Gurley a game, you want to use those in the crunch time. You want to use those in the fourth quarter. You don't want to use them early on, and then when the game gets close, you can't use him. I think it's unex- it's inexcusable, and I understand it, it's a hard situation for a young coach to go through, but they have totally mismanaged that situation, and that's really all I have to say on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to um, analyze here and break down and a lot of questions that a lot of us have. Um, I guess th- let's start with Jared Goff because we, t- we touched on, or you just touched on that. Um, it's a shame. It's it's really just, um, it's, so it's just complicated because, Jake, as you know, when, when we started the season off, I was not happy with Jared Goff. A lot of people were questioning him. A lot of people were like, oh, it's Russ. They weren't sure. Um, I just felt like a lot of people were making excuses for him. And I feel like a lot of people have been making excuses for him all season. Like you said, it is week 10. Okay? This is not um, play from a quarterback that we just paid all all that money for to be a franchise quarterback. Um, He has no business playing like this. There's a lot of things that go into the way that Jared Goff is playing. And yes, obviously one of them is our offensive line is just absolutely obliterated. Um, I'll I'll give them that. It's, it's just, it sucks. It's just a bad situation. I get that. Um, But just, again, it's these questionable calls um, from him, judgment calls um, and plays that he makes like throwing, you know, missing the wide open receiver, throwing over, you know, a wide open guy, throwing at somebody's ankles. It's just weird stuff like that that we're seeing from him that we didn't expect to see from him. That's just kind of like mind boggling. Um, and listen, you're bringing up the hit against Kansas City. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'll tell you this. If it was true, if that hit just rattled him and destroyed his confidence so much that he now has is never the same, that's not a first franchise quarterback you think Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady or anybody else is taking a big hit and is never playing the same I don't think so I think that part of being a franchise quarterback is being a leader and you know keeping it together and going out there and managing your team and that's something that I don't really see Jared Goff doing um at least not right now and so that I think is why people are concerned so that's all I have to say on Jared Goff I mean I really I just think at this point like I, all we can do is hope that he gets it together and that, you know, he starts operating on all cylinders and just takes control of this offense because he is not right now and it's not fun to watch. Um, as far as Todd Gurley, again, it's just so it's so mind boggling to me why we aren't using him. I don't understand it. Listen, if the, if the reason that the Rams aren't utilizing Todd Gurley is because they are afraid that. Um, they'll wear out his knee too fast. They aren't looking at it the right way. Listen, the reality about Todd Gurley right now, most likely, is that yes, there is a knee problem. Um, and 
it's probably going to cut his um, NFL career um, in half or maybe more. That's just the reality of it. If what we're hearing is true, then that's true. But guess what? Just utilize him. Just utilize him while you can. Then if that's the case, throw him out there. When he, when he has the ball, he does good things. When he has the ball, the Rams perform well. Um, I think they're being way too conservative with him. And unless there's something that we don't know um, or that we're completely missing, it makes absolutely no sense. When you have Todd Gurley, who is one of the best running backs in football, having, what, 12 carries a game? I mean, that's just, that makes, it, it doesn't make sense to me, especially when you have an offense that's struggling, when you have a quarterback who looks like at times he literally has no idea what he's doing. Um, you need to get Todd Gurley involved. Um, that's that's got to change. Um, I don't know what if it's coming from McVeigh. I don't know who it's coming from, but um, I can guarantee you it's not coming from Todd Gurley. Uh, I don't think I'm almost positive Todd Gurley is not saying, "Please only let me have 12 snaps a game." Um, thank you. Like that's just not happening. I don't know where it's coming from, but. Yeah, the offense uh, is not operating on all cylinders. They are looking pretty pathetic out there. Um, I mean, it's really, you know, again, when when I say this, I'm not attacking anybody's t- talent um, because we have a very talented offense, especially look at our three core receivers. I mean, they're outstanding. Um, so it's just, it's really sad that our offense is performing the way it is because when everybody on our offense including Jared Goff um is performing to the best of their ability they're pretty damn good so I mean I don't know it's it's really just like I feel like I'm I Jake I feel like I'm like talking in circles like I feel like this is all things that we've said before like I don't know what else we can say um, about the offense because it's just kind of like a bummer it's been a bummer like I don't know what else I can say about the offense now the defense you did touch on um that's kind of new because our defense has kind of been carrying our team and it, it didn't really, um, they didn't, didn't really impress against the Steelers. Um, well, I, I do think the, the, the defense was actually really good against the Steelers. Um, they got hit on a couple awful, um, penalties. One being, uh, it, in my opinion, it was terrible. And I'll explain the rule for anybody that doesn't know, but the pass interference call that negated the interception that the Rams uh, came down with, um, it was terrible. I mean, Mason Rudolph is hit while he's throwing, so the ball dies 20 yards uh, before where the receiver that he was trying to get to was, and it's a pick. Now, Ramsey gets kind of tripped up with the receiver deep down the field, and really what that is, if you're going to call anything, it's illegal contact because it's not a catchable ball. So, therefore, it would be uncatchable. And with that, you can't call pass interference. But the fact that they ruled it pass interference shows, one, that Sean Smith's uh, referee crew was atrocious the whole game, and it represents that. Two, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the rule, and they're, they made some awful calls. That was one of them. Um, you know, if you want to call that illegal contact, five-yard penalty, and negates the interception... That's fine. I'm totally cool with that. When you call it pass interference because you don't know the actual rule and you're just throwing a flag blindly because it looks like a flag, you're wrong. Um, He didn't interfere with a pass because it was 20 yards behind him. It it wasn't possible for him to even make a play on it. So therefore, it's ruled uncatchable. So uh, just a total garbage call that takes an interception off the board. Um, Goff with the the fact that he had a, uh, a pass that was going forward. And uh, they ruled it a fumble. Um, they did the whole, you know, oh, well, you know, the referees got to let the play go and they can't blow it dead. Well, it ended up really costing the Rams. Momentum really shifted towards the Steelers. Uh, Minka Fitzpatrick took a forward pass that literally went over the line of scrimmage uh, to the house and they didn't overturn it because, God forbid, the officials ever admit they're wrong. Um, next, uh, Mason Rudolph uh, going to have a shovel pass um it, it it you know maybe it wasn't a fumble but it looked just as much of a fumble as the golf play even worse mason rudolph with the pump fake as he sees clay matthews jumping up in the air just drops the ball they end up overturning that and they rule it an incomplete pass so you know there are multiple calls that were just awful it did seem to kind of go in the steelers favor 
again, when you throw 20 flags, your official crew is just out of control. Um, here's the thing. If you go to an NFL game or if you watch it on TV, the referees don't – no one cares about the referee. No one. Like, no one in their mind is like, oh, I wish they threw more flags today. No. No one wants that. So I think they slow down the game. I think they also, you know, you could have called pass interference uh, when Goff threw, uh, you know, an opportunity uh, for Reynolds to catch uh, the go-ahead touchdown. They end up, uh, you know, they kind of wrap him up, contact him before the ball gets there. That's probably at least illegal contact, if not pass interference. They decide to not blow the whistle, which I was okay with until I went back and realized that they totally um, didn't do that for the Rams defense. They stiffed them on the interception that really was a game changer. So, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and complain about the referees because the Rams, I said it the whole entire game, did not deserve to win the football game. They they just didn't. They beat themselves up way too much. It, it almost seemed that the Steelers really shot themselves in the foot, which kept the Rams in it. But uh, the the officials should never get a pass, um, especially like this. Uh, I'll say it over and over again. I believe they should be fined if they have this poor of a performance. And uh, that's all I'm going to leave that at. Going back to Todd Gurley, um, Alexis, I thought it was really interesting because Vinny Bossier, who I wish him the best of luck. He's been on here plenty of times. He's moving on to cover the, the Raiders. Uh, that was actually his last Rams game. But he tweeted out uh, something interesting. You know, he was saying how um, the Rams are really trying to do right by Todd Gurley. Um, you know, it's more so... You know, they they don't want him, they don't want to run him into the ground. They're thinking about him. Now, I can understand that. However, it, part of me believes that while you're trying to be conservative in your approach of using your star running back because he's got arthritic knee issues, you're also hurting it. And, and here's why. One, the Rams have not been responsive to the fans. They haven't been responsive to the media. They have never told us exactly what is wrong with Todd Gurley. They've never said it. They don't have to. You know, if they just put a knee injury on the injury report, that fulfills the report. The NFL doesn't have to find them or anything. But they've never told anybody. So that is kind of, you know, the worst kept secret in the league, and it, it does bother me. Uh, but I do understand it. Um, number two you're not telling anybody, you know, you're not admitting though. If you're not going to tell anybody about the injury, at least admit he's on a pitch count. Look like he can't have 20 something carries like you guys are asking him to have. I mean, this guy's on a legit pitch count. You know, McVay continues to say they are not limiting Todd Gurley. Um, I know one guy, I forget who tweeted it out on Twitter, but during the time um, it, when the Rams were playing in London, the guy ran into Kevin Demoff, and Demoff said, you'll see a, a heavy dose of Todd Gurley against uh, the Bengals. I didn't see a heavy dose of Todd Gurley at any point this season. So, um, you know, I just don't know what's going on there. But that's number two. Number three, you're doing right by Todd, but at the same time, this guy has to look like a total, well, I don't think he looks like a jerk, but you know how people are. Um, you know, people have been questioning his heart, questioning his desire, his passion. Quite honestly, it's bull. Um, but you've seen it. Well, think about just before you, you hate on Todd, before you, you judge him for his short answers, put yourself in his shoes. Would you want to be sitting at a podium every single game, eat, win or lose, every single game talking about your arthritic knee that is going to give you problems the rest of your life? All you want to do is play football, and you're constantly asked about a question that you really can't add to because the organization is trying to protect you and keep it under wraps when it's clearly not under wraps. Um, also, another thing, you know, they, they asked Todd, well, you know, did you want to be in on the fourth quarter? Like, what's he going to say? Like, you know, he came out and said, you know, I'm just used to it. I mean, so he comes out and looks like the bad guy, but it almost seems as though what is Todd supposed to say? He's not trying to throw McVay under the bus. You know, he's not trying to throw um, himself under the bus. You know, he he clearly wants to play. So it, this whole thing, you know, it may look good. It may look like you're doing a, the nice thing for Todd. But I think all this thing has done is kill his confidence. Running backs need to get into a rhythm, and he hasn't been able to do that. And I think on top of it, it it's hurting him 
it's hurting his career. I mean, this is somebody that had 40 touchdowns over the last two years, and now he's he barely broke over 400 yards in week 10. It's ridiculous. And to me, you know, now you've taken a nice gesture, if you will, in trying to protect Todd Gurley long term to the point where now you've cost your team. You're five and four. Like, you have to get it together. You can't continue to do this. Because if you continue to do this, and clearly my statistics prove that Todd Gurley is the engine that runs this offense. The Rams are 15 and 10 when Todd Gurley doesn't touch the ball 20 times. But they're all of a sudden undefeated when he does. I just think it's it's pretty clear. You know, you have to, again, if you, you can only give him 13 carries, fine. Wait until the end. Give him an opportunity to, you know, close out a game. This whole we're going to let him just sit on the bench with the helmet off in the the fourth quarter is just not working, and it's not working for the fans. It's not working for your team. So something has to give. Um, You know, they they head into uh, week 11 here um, against the uh, Bears on, I believe it's Sunday Night Football. So, um, and then they have the Ravens on Monday night. So they have to get it together. I'm sorry, the Ra- the Rams are not going to make the playoffs if they don't change the way they're using Todd Gurley. Because this offense isn't magically going to get better. I mean, this offense was so predicated on play action. This offense was so predicated on jet motion. And, I mean, they didn't really use much of that in the Steelers game. And yet they still only lost by, you know, one score. So it go- kind of goes to show you the defense is is you know, pitching a shutout, if you will. They're not really, but, you know, they're giving them an opportunity. The offense is not, you know, succeeding. And, and if that doesn't, you know, change, then the Rams are going to be watching from home in January, and they will not be in the playoffs. And that's something I can't believe I'm saying because this is a team I had going 15-1. and one. I had them beating the, the uh, Patriots in the Super Bowl in a rematch. And everything just seemed to be like this is a better team and all of that. But when you really look at it, it goes back to what we were saying. The offensive line was always the the detriment to this team. They, it was always the ticking time bomb. If everyone stayed healthy magically like 2017, this team would be fine. However, that's just not realistic. And as you're seeing, you know, they lose John Johnson, they lose Brian Allen, they lose Rob Havenstein, they lose Darius Williams. I mean, there's so many different losses on this team. All the all these injuries are coming up. They lost to Keith Tlaib and they ended up trading him. Like, it, it's going to, it could get worse. I mean, injuries don't just stop because, you know, oh, well, you know, that sucks. Uh, well, you know, we can't have any more injuries like that, right? I mean, remember Steve Spagnuolo's Rams set the record for injuries in a season of in an NFL season. So uh, they're ruthless, and you know, it, it, tomorrow if you know Jared Goff goes down or, or you know Whitworth goes down, I mean, this team has to be able to fight through it. There's a lot of injuries, and this is still a good football team, and they're going to have to find a way to fight through it. And I think the only way they can do that. Is going back to what they did last year, late last year, to combat the fact that Jared Goff simply wasn't himself. They brought on C.J. Anderson, and they utilized a two-running back backfield. They had C.J. and Todd go over 100 yards in the NFC Divisional game against the Cowboys. They can do something like that. They have Malcolm Brown, Daryl Williams, and John Kelly really just run at this def- whatever defense that lines up across from them, wear them out, and then have Todd Gurley come out at you know in the end. And this guy hasn't had any carries in the game, and now all of a sudden the defense is softened up, the offense is broken in, and there you go. You can have him completely close the game like a closer in baseball. That is, that is what they'll have to do if they want to have him on a pitch count. If they don't and they're serious about just playing him the rest of the way, have him have 25 touches a game because you're going to need him if you want to even sniff the postseason. No, I definitely agree. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on. It, it makes no sense. Um, you would think that they would have thought about everything that we were saying. Um, but, you know, I think it's only hurting us by not having Todd Gurley out there. I think that, you know, he it, he's just got to be out there. Like you said, we're five and four. Um, and not only are we five and four, we're, we're in a division with the Seahawks and the 49ers. So um, 
things have to drastically change for us to even have a chance at making the playoffs right now. Um, I think you've got to start by getting Gurley involved more, um, as well as, you know, Goff's got to um, get it together as well. Yeah, I mean, he, re- he really does. Um, and, and, you know, it's not just Goff. I mean, I, I do want to point that out. I mean, he's struggling for sure, but um, this can be fixed. You know, the Rams are 5-4. and four. They're not 5-5. Five and five. They're not 5-6. and six. They're not 5-7. and seven. So a lot of people, you know, saying the season's over, it's not. It looks really bleak right now because you're so accustomed to Sean McVay and the W. But guess what? Sean McVay has taken four losses. And guess what? He still hasn't had as many losses as he's had the most in his career as a head coach. That was five in 2017. So he still hasn't hit that. The Rams still have an opportunity. They play the fifth toughest schedule, so they're going to have to earn it. But, I mean, we've seen this team, you know, go on some winning streaks. You know, they still have talent, and they'll be getting Brandon Cooks back in the near future. Um, you know, I think it is lo- maybe, maybe just maybe, they needed this. Maybe this wakes up McVay, and it's just like, you know what? We can't have Jared thrown 41 times with no protection in a one-possession game like that. It just can't happen. Um, and maybe, just maybe, they start using Todd. If you want to make the argument that it's because you know Todd's knee that they don't run the football, that's a poor argument because guess what? Going back to Carolina, that game, week one, whatever the Rams wanted to do in that game, I'm, I fully supported that. You know, and, and here's the thing. I want Todd to get over 20 carries. I do. But... Do you remember the Carolina game, Alexis? Because the Carolina game was very important. It set the tone for the season. Now, the Rams didn't follow this suit. They won 30-27 to in a game where really the defense gave up over 200 yards to Christian McCaffrey. Can you imagine this offense overcoming that right now? Absolutely not. But they did at the beginning of the year, and why was that? Jared Goff, he had 186 yards, a touchdown and interception. So, I mean, it's not like he did anything to really push them. No. What ended up happening was they ran 32 times. Todd Gurley ran 14 times for 97 yards. That was 6.9 yards per carry. Didn't get in the end zone, but he got him set up there for Malcolm Brown to punch it in twice. For whatever reason, and those two combined for over almost 150, actually 150 yards on the dot on 25 carries. Those two, I mean, you have a guy that the Lions literally were trying to sign an offer sheet to and trying to make him a, a you know potentially uh, have a huge role in that, that Lions backfield. I mean, he'd be a starter right now. And you're not using him. And Daryl Henderson, I mean, you're not really using him either. Let's be real here. It's not just Todd Gurley. Sean McVay has abandoned the run. This doesn't mean that Sean McVay is a bad coach or he's doomed or anything like that. He's still young. He just needs to get it together because right now the Rams need balance. We've said this before, um, but they're going to need to, you know, make things easier for Jared, and it starts with the run game. But with that being said, um, before we close this thing out, we do have to answer uh, just three questions um, from our fans. Uh, Brian Cantwell it asks, uh, do you foresee any interest in Hargreaves? And he's talking about Vernon Hargreaves, uh, who was actually cut today um, by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in kind of a surprising move. But at the same time, he's been what you would call a bust. First round pick that really hasn't amounted to much. What are your thoughts on that, Alexis? Because I don't really see interest in him. I think the Rams are really just solely focused on the offensive line. Yeah, I don't really think think that that's a, a realistic oppor- you know opportunity or, or need for us but I mean you know why not I guess I don't know I mean you know you could make the argument with Darius Williams and and how it depends on the injury but then you could also just call up um you know Dante Dion from the practice squad so I don't know if it gets done I, I don't think so um but you know we'll see on that um Manuel uh at girly fry season um, he sends us, uh, knowing we have big contracts for the next two to four years, almost no, uh, almost no first rounders. Where do you see this team going in the future? Getting back out post Super Bowl self. Um, I'll well, I'll let you answer that first. Well, I mean, I think the answer is I don't know. I mean, 
think you're right. I mean, we have big contracts coming up. Um, we don't have any first round draft picks, um, you know, for a while or, or not many draft picks. Um, so it, you know, it is kind of a tough situation. I mean, it's just something that, you know, we gave a lot of money to our quarterback guys. We gave them a lot of money. And so, you know, that means that there's less money, you know, for other people. And that's something that, you know, we got to work out. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Um, I have a weird feeling. Maybe it's just Mr. Optimist in me that they're going to get this fixed. Um, I think, you know, some of the articles that have been written, they're really jumping the gun there. Uh, forgetting, you know, the the two years. I mean, Sean McVay has done something that really not many coaches do. Leading a, a team like that to the playoffs his first year as a head coach, and you can say he had all the talent already on the roster all you want, but, I mean, that's still not a given. And then his second year going to the Super Bowl. And God forbid his third year they're 5-4, and four, uh, heading into week 11 with a chance to go 6-4. and four. Um, Don't he, – here's the thing I want to say. Don't take the NFC – the way the teams are playing and penalize Sean McVay and the Rams for it because the the Rams play their own schedule. The Seahawks play their own schedule. The 49ers play like you can't, if the Rams finished 10 and six, that was not a bad season for what they went through. And if they miss the playoffs, you can't penalize them for that. They didn't get it done fine, but 10 and six is not a bad record. You see what I'm saying? And especially that means that they were to, to pretty much win out except for two games and they play, you know, some tough opponents. So I guess that's kind of where I'm getting at that. Where do I see, um, see this team going in the future? I think they have a, they obviously have some, you know, some opportunities that they, I mean, I don't think, you know, guys like Michael Brockers are going to be, you know, feasible to pay, um, you know, long term. Brockers, if he comes back on a cheaper deal, you know, sure. I do think they want to bring Corey Littleton back. Obviously, they want to extend um, Jalen Ramsey. They want to just gain, you know, hold of, of the guys that they want to keep in the building. Now, they're going to have to make a tough decision because if they're not going to use Todd Gurley, then they're going to have to trade him. Because if you're too worried about playing a guy, uh, there's another team in the league that's going to want to play him. And if the Rams aren't winning, here's here's how I'll look at this. If the Rams are winning, Todd probably doesn't have any problem doing whatever. He wants to help the team win any way possible. That I mean, he is just that type of guy. But when the Rams start losing and say they miss the playoffs, Todd's not going to be happy. And I'm not saying he'll demand a trade, but you, you do – things have to get fixed on that end. Um, so, yeah, I think that they're, they're going to be fine. I think that uh, they're probably still going to make the playoffs this year. And I think if they make the playoffs, then they're probably the most dangerous team because you literally have no idea. If they made the playoffs uh, looking at 5-4, and four, that means they went on a run. And you have no idea what type of team you're going to get. And they'll you know likely be more healthier than they were right now. So I do think they'll be fine. I think the overreacting articles and stuff, I, I can't really get behind. I don't think they're a cautionary tale. Sure, they're trading away picks. I still don't think it's fair to just judge it off of, you know, 10 weeks in the NFL when, I mean, this guy was just in the Super Bowl, you know, coaching his team against Bill Belichick. Um, so that's my take on that. But uh, last one, Rand got beats. Is this current O-line the worst in Rams history? Alexis, your thoughts. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is, guys. We are in the thick of it with the worst offensive line in Rams history. Well, yeah, you know what? I stand by that. I mean, I, I'm trying to think, like, of course, like in my head right now, like if statistically they're the worst. I don't. They might not statistically be the worst, but I wouldn't know that. But just I'm pretty confident that this is the worst hmm. in my history that I've ever seen. This is the worst offensive line that I can remember seeing for the Rams. That is very interesting. Um, hmm. I'm going to say no. And here's why I'm going to say no. Because as bad as this Rams offense looks, they still have had some success this year. Let's not forget the 2009 Rams averaged 10.5 points per game. 
Now, spoiler alert, they ranked last in the NFL at that. Um, Wait, we're talking about offensive line, though, right? Not just offense. We're talking about offensive line. Yeah, offensive line, but I'm getting to that point. So so people would say, well, you know, I mean, it's not the offensive line's fault. They had Kyle Bowler and Keith Null. Well, they got, I mean, you know, Bolger was there as well. That offensive line was putrid. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I still remember when I remember when the Rams drafted Jason Smith. That was that was bad. I remember when the Rams drafted Alex Barron, assuming that he would uh, be the answer. That was bad. I remember when the Rams drafted Greg Robinson. Now that was bad. Now those three guys I mentioned are probably worse than anybody on this offensive line. I'm going to be honest with you right now. Greg Robinson was absolutely terrible. But in 2009, the Rams offensive line of Alex Barron at left tackle, Jacob Bell at left guard, Jason Brown at center, Richie Incognito at right guard, and Adam Goldberg at right tackle might have been worse than this one. And that's sad because of all the injuries that we've seen. But that team was literally 1-15. 1-15. I mean, the year before it, a guy by the name of Nick Lecky was playing center. I mean, guys, it's bad. Don't get me wrong. They've also battled injuries. Maybe I would make the argument 2007. Um, I mean, Alex Barron, Milford Brown, Brett Romberg, Brandon Gorin. I, 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 you know, it, it doesn't, it's not good. You know, a lot of these are not good at all. I mean, they keep in mind, Sam Bradford had an offensive line of Roger Saffold, Jacob Bell, Jason Brown, Adam Goldberg, and Jason Smith. And he somehow led them to seven and nine. The year, the next year, 2011, they went two and 14 and you had Roger Saffold, Jacob Bell, Jason Brown, Tony Raggy, and Harvey Dahl. Um, and I liked Harvey Dahl, but I mean, then the next year, Roger Saffold, Robert Turner, Harvey Dahl, Barry Richardson. I mean, no. I, I wouldn't say this is the worst offensive line ever for the Rams. Um, recently, I mean, they've had some really bad offensive lines. And so I just, I, I don't really buy that as much. Um, but that that is really, that's my take on that. You know, I think... Uh, I think you could definitely say that this team is not as good. It's not as equipped at offensive line, but I don't think it's the worst ever. But I do like that question. I would, you know, I do like the question. Um, with that being said, uh, I think that's going to wrap it up. So for Jake Ellenbogen, she's Alexis Craft. This has been the Downtown Rams podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Until next time, you guys take care. Horns up.